Well, it feels like ancient history, though. Barcelona did, did beat Villarreal 3-1 on Saturday. That's mainly what he yeah. we're going to talk about. So, um, you know, my when I did the match review for YouTube a few days ago, my first yeah. point, and I think where I want to start with the broad picture, the Magoy, is that hmm. they did play the full 90 minutes. And I know we're going to talk about the tactics, the first issues, if you will, under Xavi, yada, 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 all that stuff. Um, yeah. But even if they didn't deserve the result, they won hmm. and they collected the three points. And it was a match that, again, even Xavi said Villarreal didn't deserve to lose. And yeah. I think that kind of sums up the result. But a 3-1 victory for Barcelona, it was the first time in a long time when the equalizing was- goal happened and I didn't feel like it was going to be a draw. And that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing, especially when you talk about Villarreal, who are kind of the, the experts of drawing games uh, lately. And yeah, you said it perfectly. I mean, Villarreal are a good team. It was always going to be a tough match. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you just have to be able to get wins like those. I mean, it was not convincing. To be honest, the first 20 minutes were pretty, pretty good. I, I thought that we were really good in the first 20 minutes. We kind of controlled the game. We kind of m- m- managed to set up the tempo and control it well. And then it sort of fell apart, uh, which is a big issue. It has been a big issue for, for years now. Barca haven't been able to kind of uh maintain dominance even if they did manage to kind of dominate or control games for for a certain period of time um so it will be something for Xavi definitely to look into um but yeah difficult game and i'm happy for the three points not so happy about the performance but yeah sometimes you just you just have to take those three points and just run away with it yeah i think Villarreal in this instance does deserve a little bit of respect i mean they've just been embarrassed by manchester united the uh, united mm. they were playing at home uh, I, yeah, I, I think they're at a, a place, that being Villarreal, where they felt at home more desperate to win yeah. than Barcelona even should have. Because Barcelona, I think for the rest of this season, until they get up to top four, which, again, I want to do the math on this, they're not too far away from. So yeah. it, it's still fully possible. It's still just the end of November. Um, and so every match of Barcelona, especially from a Kool-Aid perspective, is going to feel desperate. But for Villarreal, like, they're in the bottom of the half of the table. So it does yeah. feel a bit desperate. And I think I think Unai Emery, to his credit, also got his tactics right about where he was yeah. trying to exploit Barcelona. And again, before we do the Javi tactics, that's, I think, the main bulk of our show here. I do yeah. want to talk about Easy Abde, um, arguably the man of the match against Espanyol in the 45 minutes. He came on, the 19-year-old from Hercules, 17 appearances, two goals for them. Um, I mm. kind of mentioned it in passing before. I mean, I looked high and low for any other stories or any other pieces about his time at Hercules. And I don't think that, you know, the Spanish journalists have been so busy dealing with Xavi and so busy getting all the scoops um, around, let's say, the, the big, big stories that his signing kind of went under the radar. He's a 200 million euro release clause. This is one of those late on signings. And I know he's 19, so he's a bit older than the likes of, I think, Pedro when he was signed from uh, from Las Palmas or no, for Tenerife, for Tenerife mm-hmm. when he was 17. Tenerife. Yeah, so that was like a late signing for Barca B or for the academy, but he was signed for Barca B, but the club always knew that he had the potential to reach the first team. It just happened that Mm. it was a need and a desire for him um, so early, but he is adept with both feet and obviously very, very fast, you Mm. know, and, you know, easy Abde, people are already kind of saying, okay, well, there's insurance for Dembele, but, you know, I think the Ferran Torres rumor this week tells you that the insurance for Dembele is out there, that if Dembele does leave, that means that a an actual, you know, we'll say top class right winger is going to yeah. be brought in. But in the meantime, Domagoy, what have you seen from Easy Abde? And um, before everybody kind of uh, overrates him and all the parody accounts pop up about him or, you know, not the parody accounts, whatever, the Stan accounts, right? Before they all pop yeah. up. Um, yeah. How do you feel about the youngster? Oh, I love him. I love him so much because he is the exactly the type of player that Xavi wants to have in his team. So one of the big things that Xavi definitely want to implement here is verticality because that's what Barca have missed for so long. And just the pace and trickery and one, one-on-one duels. And even Kuman was screaming about that. He was saying that he needs that kind of a player, but you know, Xavi now has him in Abde uh, and he would have him in Dembele as well if, if, if Dembele was fit, of course. But I think that Abde, uh, he is mature for his age, which is which is uncommon too. And just having that natural winger with pace, that trickery and just unpredictability, that's that's crucial for Barcelona because they're a team that, that, that doesn't have clear outlets, right? Apart from Jordi Alba, who is there? There's no one else. And now suddenly you have someone on the right side to kind of revive the whole flank because the right side of Barcelona attack has been very luck lax so you know that we, we've seen you know the likes of Sergio Roberto play there as, as a right wing back or a, a right winger even Dest who is I mean Dest could be a 
decent winger, but he's not really a winger. So again, it's not really ideal. But Abde, man, I, I love him. I love him. And uh, he adds that necessary spark that Barca have needed. And hopefully he gets more game time. Yeah, I think he will get some game time still in the first team. I'm going to hedge my bet a little bit uh, and not say that what he's done is exciting based on the expectations mm-hmm. we had for him. Of course. Which yeah. is being, again, I, I think it was 2 million euros in total, the signing from Hercules. Um, but for, yeah, for, for Abde, I, I think that there's so much to work on and improve. And those things are actually workable, as we mm-hmm. say. So not even just a finishing product, because the header yeah. was the best chance in the first half that Barca had. So credit yeah. to him to get himself in the box, get himself free. He also at 19 already has the broad shoulders of a man, something like Nico. They're, they're, they're already strong. They're already mm-hmm. 19 years old. And they're already, you know, kind of f- filled out into their adult bodies, if you will. And that's mm-hmm. only going to get he's only going to get more comfortable in that body. Um, yeah. But yeah, as far as getting around his his defender and then what happens next, that's going to be the biggest thing. It's the same thing with Ilash Komas as well. We saw him his skill against yes. uh, against Espanol. He warmed against Villarreal. That is now Ilias had just a mercurial talent about him that he is mm-hmm. capable of some really, really wonderful things. There are just things mm-hmm. that need to be improved. Obviously, you know, you could do uh, amazing things for 98 percent of the field. But if you don't have that final ball, if you don't have an yeah. attack that's finished, well, then you're just a young player who's still working on those things. So for Abde, I mean, you saw how the game changed when Dembele came on. Yes, yeah. Villarreal was kind of worn down a little bit and Dembele was able to go right at him. But just how much more dangerous Dembele could be and how, and not only for Villarreal defensively, how Villarreal had to bring that second man a lot quicker. We're talking steps quicker to Dembele to slide over for those doubles than against Abde. Abde, they generally, that being Villarreal, kept him uh, kept him attacking 1v1 and defended him yeah. 1v1 as opposed to Dembele that always needs help. Um, but yeah, but do you have yeah. anything more on Abde? Because we're going to, he kind of does fit into the first tactical yes, nuance we want to talk about. I mean, the thing with him against Villarreal specifically was that he was, he was forced very deep. That has to be mentioned. And that kind of impacted what he could do higher up the pitch because he needed to cover a lot more ground just because he had to cover for Eric Garcia, who had to uh, man Mark Moy Gomez. He was pulled away. So Abde had to go, go down the pitch. And that kind of impacted what he could do uh, in attack as well. So, yes, I, I do get your point and I agree. Dembele is more of a, let's just put it, well-rounded player now compared to Abde because Abde is just a raw talent that mm-hmm. needs to needs to work a lot. But Dembele is also a similar thing. I think Dembele physically, like, you know, his explosiveness and dribbling, that's all top-notch. He just needs to be, of course, he needs to be more fit. That's the first thing. And the other thing is Dembele needs to play more smartly, I guess. He needs to know how to time his runs, when to run, where to run, how to drag his markers. Sometimes he needs to run just for the sake of pulling away markers, not to expect to receive the ball. And he doesn't have those instincts just yet, I think. And that's the same thing with Abde and Ilyas, even, you know, those young players, that young wingers, they need to know uh, when to move, how to move, not just being this pure physical talent that will kind of burst past his marker and do stuff, you know, just pure talent alone. Well, Demolay is a tough case because if he does renew at FC Barcelona at the age yeah. of 24, the yeah. young winger is in no way what you could clarify him. It's going to be in no way what you clarify his salary. I mean, even his salary yeah. now shouldn't be clarified as young winger at 24. But, uh, you know, as I've said before on the show, he's missed so much time that in truth, he's actually about a 21-year-old winger in terms of actually playing on the field because of missing I mean, so, 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 so many games. But speaking of young players, that's kind of what the theme of today's show is. Uh, and you've already brought up the first, basically the first mistake. And I, I put huge air quotes on it for those who are watching the video. The first big mistake that Xavi was honest about with his tactics was having Eric Garcia, man, Mark Moyes, Gomez, and mm-hmm. basically play as more of a right back even than a right center back. And then Abde would come back and defend deep when Villarreal would try to strong side their left mm-hmm. side attacking and Barcelona's right side defending. And Xavi has explained, though, that the idea is to have those wingers defend deeper. So that's mm-hmm. not the issue here. I think um, then when Barcelona retake the ball, they are given space on the wings to go 1v1 against their defenders. And as that happens, now here's the missing piece of the puzzle. As that mm-hmm. happens, the interiors need to be pushing up and making runs in behind, of yeah. which only Frankie de Young is doing regularly, at least against Espanyol and Villarreal and not against Benfica or a talented team that sat in a low block against Barca. And occasionally, Gavi is doing it, but he's doing it yeah. wide and around the back line as a left winger, as opposed to yeah. in those half spaces where Xavi wants his, his interiors to, to push into uh, in this 3-4-3 you know, three, three lineup. 
But, you know, it would be great if if Gabi was, you know, making that same run as the interior, but he's actually the left winger. So, yeah. I mean, pretty clear that we see the issue there, right? He's actually making the runs that I think Xavi is instructing him to make on that left wing, playing as technically this attacking left winger. Um, but instead, you know, if he made the same run in the half space as that that left interior, you could see how how dangerous Gabi could be. We can see, I mean, yeah. again, you plug Pedri in the same position and you see how dangerous Pedri can be. But what I do like is that Xavi did admit that he got some things wrong. And I like that. Yeah. I'm not trying, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not trying to defend Eric Garcia, but of course, tons of people, including many I respect, again, after this match, reiterated their belief that he's not at the level. But I do have to wonder what instructions he was given in that match because Eric Garcia keeps going from, oh, he looks fine. He looks like he should be the, you know, libero, the one who is pulling all the strings, is passing, is progressive passing when Barcelona are in possession. We're all cool right. with all those things. And then the minute he's put on this island like this, defending, then he winds up being the scapegoat for this. But I like this fact that Xavi was accountable to it and saying both both he and uh, Eric, that being, and Xavi in their press conferences said, there's a lot of instructions. There's a lot going on behind the scenes and we're trying to catch up as soon as we can. And I don't think, as I said, from Eric all the way up the field, it's all connected. So don't forget that. But because he's a defender, it all comes back on him. And of course, social media is going to say, hey, he's a 20-year-old center back, but his, he's limited physically. So he's never going to improve. This is what Eric Garcia is. And, you know, he's only Gareth 2.0 is what I keep saying. <laughs> um, well, I think generally I don't dislike the idea. So this was more of a not really a nominal 3-4-3 system. It was more of a asymmetrical 4-3-3 because when Alba tucks in and uh, drops deeper into the back line, that's when Eric Garcia pushes up into the midfield. So you, you get the back three, but you get it with a one fullback deep and one other fullback kind of asymmetrically, he goes uh, higher up the pitch. So, and that way you can ensure that the, uh, the numerical advantage in the first line with the three defenders against two wheelhouse, two forwards, and you get to overload the midfield when Eric Garcia pushes up. So again, in theory, I get what Xavi was trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that this was this also impacted how Gavi moved, because as you said, Gavi would always move on the outside. And that's because when Alba would tuck in, there was no one else to provide the width on the left side. And you remember, Xavi wants to have both of his wingers wide, at, at least initially, and then Gavi would tuck in eventually when Alba overlaps. But if Alba is deep into the back line, then no one else can provide the width on the left side. And that's where Gavi comes in. He has to be the one who can stretch the pitch and stretch the back line and ensure that there's, there's more space in the half spaces for Barca and Memphis to operate. So that's kind of the thing with Gavi. And with, uh, with Eric Garcia, yes, I do agree. Uh, he's kind of, he's excellent on the ball, but then physically and defensively in one versus one duels, he's not as proficient. The way he operates is he's more of a early prevention kind of thing. So he will have to read the game much better and much faster than his opposition and then kind of intercept the ball before the danger is, you know, on, on high alert. So I think that's how he operates. Uh, and how does Xavi kind of combat that? I don't know. He can either try and improve that aspect of his game or kind of try and cover with other profiles in the back line, with, like Araujo, for example. Araujo would have to cover for Eric um, in those situations. And I, I guess that that is the only way uh, that Eric is going to kind of succeed, I guess. I mean, I don't dislike him. I, I think he has a lot of potential, and I do. I will release a piece on him very soon because I find this all very, very um, interesting to, to kind of talk about. But... Uh, at the moment, he's not exactly playing to the full of his potential, but he is a key cog in at Barcelona's backline because he is the only profile that's purely ball progression. When it comes to ball progression, no one can touch him, really. Araujo is not that good on the ball. He is decent, but not as good as Eric. And PK is kind of diminishing. And then you have Longley and Umtiti who are good on the ball, but at the same time, they're not really re reliable. So I guess he is necessary, but at the same time, there's always a risk. Uh, with him so it's it's a strange case <laughs> well I, and I think too that whether because neither Araujo or Eric Garcia are left-footed you understand right. why Xavi put Eric Garcia on the right side because as we keep saying that they mm -hmm. un, I mean this will probably not change when Ansu comes back either I mean it could when Ansu comes back and you actually have a real left winger starting on the mm -hmm. touchline and just attacking but again he's not this yeah. this dribbling uh, no. left winger. So I would actually not be that surprised if in this system, Ansu plays in the middle and Memphis plays on the left and you let him uh, dribble okay. a little bit more, but we'll have to see what happens there. That yeah. said, 
I understand why it was Langley against Benfica, as I said before, and then Araujo as the left center back starting against Villarreal. Well, it was actually PK as the left center back, and then Araujo in the middle playing basically, yeah. you know, snuff everything out. And that makes sense because, I mean, while PK can pass the ball, Eric is actually a better passer, um, mm. or at least breaks lines a little bit more and is a bit more with his progressive yeah. passing uh, essential to the system of possession. And so I understand why you want to put your best center back passer on the side that is just with a one, one V one winger behind so that Mm -hmm. when you strong side, the other side, that left center back doesn't have to pass the ball 15 or 20 yards and break a line. So you're putting all the onus on your right center back to break that line, as opposed to, Mm -hmm. again, Benfica and Lengley is a better example of this than PK because PK is again, a a better passer than Lengley, but Lengley only had to make 10 to 15 to 20 yard passes to Alba, Mm -hmm. to Gabi, to Frankie or Nico, and then to Busquets or back to one of the other center backs. So his, passing range, which is that left center back passing range is so much more limited. Um, but yeah, and then you're pouring on Araujo, seven ball recoveries, won all five of his duels, five clearances, two interceptions, didn't commit a single foul. And other than the, the shot that went wide by Don Juma, Araujo was everywhere he needed to be. Uh, exactly. And so Barcelona have at least one defender, at least one very high quality passing, uh, progressive passing center back. And then they also exactly. have the leadership of Gerard Piquet, which I actually think under Xavi, now that he has people to lead again, that being PK, mm-hmm. I, I think he's he's found his role as a leader. And while he cannot physically do all of it, um, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's worked out. And then the final point I have about these center backs uh, before I throw it over to you is that Albert Roche, who uh, he's very well trusted throughout the academy, um, mm-hmm. uh, sports uh, sport journalist, also reported that Diego Almeida, who I talked about before, he got called up to the um, Ecuadorian national team, which is huge for him at 17, plays with the Juvenil yeah. Oz. He noticed that being Roger, that Almeida was playing the same position that Eric Garcia played for, for who now ah. And what mm-hmm. Almeida is, is a, he's a little bit, um, I, I mean, he's still 17. He's still growing into his body, but he's maybe not going to be a Rajo, but he's going to be physically, I think, a bit more impressive, at least uh, mm-hmm. at this point than Eric Garcia. But he is a right center back playing out wide, basically as a right back this weekend for who now ah. So that's mm-hmm. another thing where I wonder, is this an entire system change? Is Xavi asking a certain thing? of the profile of a right center back moving forward. Uh, And these are just structural things that that you have to wonder. Um, And then the one player I want you to talk about with this is the 20 year old left footed center back, Mika Marmol for Barca Mm -hmm. B. Um, You know, he's a case where is he really ready to take that job over from Langley, PK Garcia or Umtiti? Because just like Easy Abde or Elias, I could see Mm -hmm. just like you, I could see Marmol Mm -hmm. getting a, or getting some time over Langley in um, um Titi or Garcia playing at left center back because Marmo might be the profile that Xavi is looking for for that position. Mm, he definitely is because Mika is very progressive and he's left footed and that is kind of a commodity in world football now. It's just finding a left center center back, left foot center back is, is just amazing. Uh and I think that he has the the skill set to kind of fit into Xavi's system because he is He's very comfortable on the ball. He can run with the ball. When he sees the space, he will exploit it. He will go for it. He will dribble if he has to. And then he will deploy a pass that can break lines and can connect the thirds as well. So I think in that aspect, he is he is the perfect fit, actually. So, yeah, he is very young. So you can never know how that transition is going to go. Maybe he doesn't do as well. But I think that he has the potential to do well. And I would definitely trust him over MTT and Longley. I would just try it out and see how he goes because... You don't have much to lose with such a player because the upside is just incredible. If he if he does work out, like Araujo, for example, you have you've sold a major issue in a team that you haven't been able to fix for for years now, I, I guess even. And I would I would give him a shot because he is he's not the most physical one. He is pretty tall, I think, but but not as like not physically too strong. He's still a decent duelist still, but but not as not at Araujo level. No, nowhere near that. But he can he can uh, match forwards with pace mostly. He is de- decently fast and excellent on the ball. So I would just say he is the perfect fit for that left center back position. I've I've said this before, and I'll. I stand by it, and I think that Xavi is eventually going to kind of take the leap and, and just and just see if it works out. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean that brings up I think the bigger question, and really the reason why I want to bring you back on the show because of the, like some of the research you're doing and some of the thoughts that 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 we'll say the pathway from Barca B or Juvenil A or the academy in gen at large to the yeah. first team. 
right, was this place that under the likes of Sergio Roberto, and then we're skipping ahead. We're talking about Carlos Alanya. We're talking about Jared De La Feu. Um, yeah. they're, they're just, I, I think that conversation is well trod about players having difficulty getting to the first team. But now yeah. it seems like the dam has been broken completely open out of necessity for both financial reasons, uh, as well as the talent itself deserving to be first team players for FC Barcelona in the likes of Gabi and Nico and Ansu. Uh, yep. And I mean, again, Eric Garcia is, you know, La Masia raised, but he was brought back in as a transfer, yeah. but a free transfer. So that was, that made sense with that deal. Pedri again, brought from Las Palmas. So it doesn't fall under that umbrella. It just happens to be around the same age. So Gino Dest, you know, was brought in. Araujo even was brought in from Uruguay, not being a La Masia product, if you will. Um, so even though they are young, uh, er, uh, Oscar Mangaitha and uh, Kayato to the other ones that I'm, I'm missing on that list. Um, but yeah, the question now we ask, when we think about easy Abde and now we're having this conversation about is Marmol what would be needed for the left center back spot. I do want to ask broadly, how many youngsters are too many youngsters? Because Xavi is showing, especially with Elias, a willingness where, I mean, I'd said, and people who watch him, I mean, uh, shouts to Naveed Molagai who watched him for years as well, that he might be christened in the Academy as this, you know, the Moroccan Messi and all this, you know, things yes. to roll our eyes on. But I felt like he was a year or two away. It felt like he was a year or two away when you watch him with Hubenel Ah. He was making some appearances for Barca B. He got that brace, but he hasn't even been a regular for Barca B. So I'm playing with the Hubenel Ahs even this season. So for him to make the jump to a first team, it is mm-hmm. it is surprising to me because I think the club all felt like, okay, he'll be ready someday. But then yeah. you have so many other youngsters that we can talk about. Hunter Orellana, who's injured now and on and off for two years. Alvaro yeah. Sanz, both defensive midfielders. Um, you know, when, with Busquets' age, why would those guys not get opportunities potentially? Chus Alba yeah. has that ability to push very high. So if Xavi's going to play two high interiors, Chus Alba, an 18-year-old, yeah. Ruben Al-Az, a good look. Arnau Kosas, who's a right-footed center back, uh, 17 years old. I think put a pin in that one a few years on him. Mark Casada is another one. He's, what, 17, 18 years old around that age too. And then you yes. have center forwards like Victor Barbera, who was just brought in. Um, to the academy to Hubenel Ah from I think it was um, Royce or maybe oh no no Dom it was uh, Estenas Pedrola who was brought in from to to from Royce but anyway then Fabian R- Luzzi who was brought in from Raya Vallecano he's 17 as well uh, then Anjo Alacan who's been injured I really like Alacan I actually think he mm-hmm. would be in the first team dynamic on that left wing if he wasn't injured for this entire year um, but yeah. it just feels like too many youngsters you can't have that many young players in your squad and if anything. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I can let you, uh, you know, basically, I mean, you've written so much about all these different players, so you can dish mm-hmm. on whichever ones you want. But for me, actually, I would like to see more of, if I have to say one youngster, I, I'd stick my neck out for it's Alejandro Balde. Um, mm-hmm. I think Balde, who now came on as a substitute for Barca B of the weekend uh, with Alba getting injured, that was the right moment for Balde. It's just wrong place mm-hmm. at the wrong time in this instance where he was on the bench and Alba was healthy. Alba gets the knock and Balde isn't there. He's playing with Barca B. But I think Balde is the exact player on that left wing um, to come in for Alba. And not only that, but to start occasionally. Uh, and I think there's something that Xavi might think he's missing or he's just, you know, trusting Alba in this opportunity, right? That it's a new manager. Yeah. He wants Alba to be the one to be instructed with those instructions. But I, I think Balde by April or May, I could easily see him being fully, mm-hmm. fully in the first team and just coming off the bench a lot, making appearances, maybe even more so over deaths, depending on the system and tactics that Xavi wants to employ. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I would definitely put Balde ahead of Dest on the left side. Definitely. I wouldn't, I mean, Dest on the left side was decent at times, but I just don't see it long term. I just don't see it. It has to be on the right side. Um, as for Balde, just taking over all, but yes, that, he was one of the youngsters that I really thought I was going to make it right now. Uh, the, the situation was like prime for him with the Alba, with the injuries and all that stuff. But I just he just disappeared for some reason, and uh, I think I think his time will still come. He he can and he has the potential to do so. Um, it remains to be seen how well he can handle the the wing back role, sort of that that Chavi is trying trying to do with the three four three system. We'll see how that goes. Is that going to play to his strengths or not? I'm not sure at the moment. We'll see. We'll have to scout that a bit more. Uh, just generally on youngsters, I think, yes, I believe there always has to be a healthy mix of youth and experience. That's that's kind of a given. But at the same time, Barcelona is somewhat unique in this regard, purely because of, of the academy. Because using at- academy players and using quote-unquote foreign players who you bought on the market is not nearly the same thing, especially in Barca's case. Uh, that's because 
Barcelona's philosophy and this kind of very specific style of play are completely ingrained across all youth levels. And that makes a difference because uh, when you promote from within, you are getting a player who is, yes, of course, he doesn't have any real experience at the highest levels, like in La Liga, for example, but you're getting a player who is very comfortable with the style of play of the first team. So you are getting uh, a player uh, who knows their role and knows how to perform them well, because that's, you know, that's what they've been doing for the whole, well, whole lives, whole careers, uh, if, they were, if they were in La Masia for a longer period of time than it is. So whether it's the, the Benjamin level, the Juanil level, Barca B, they all play the same style of football, and that's the same style the, f- the first team wants to play. So I think that's a huge, uh, huge point towards having like more youngsters in the team. So what do you think the likes of Gavi and Nico can have kind of hit the ground running? Because they've, they have the experience of uh, already playing in the same system. Um, so I would still prefer having, you know, a healthy mix of, of youth and experience, of course, you know, just for the biggest of occasions, you know, kind of the uh, decisive games, the Champions, Champions League nights and, you know, cup finals, whatnot. But generally speaking, I don't see it as such a big problem. But of course, there always, ha- always has to be a balance. Uh, so yeah, that's that's what I would say. <laughs> well, there's a downside too, because Yusuf Demir started in what was Barcelona's, I mean, you could argue is going to go down in their most important match of the season against Benfica mm-hmm. and in that match. And Demir is a player that looks like, I mean, he looked, I thought he was bright in that game uh, with the two attempts. He could have had a brace with four inches. I said that before in last week's show. But yeah, I, I think Demir is an example of a player that, where there is too many youngsters. You just don't have enough mm-hmm. time to carve out for the guy that doesn't exactly fit, right? And, and so if you have Demir and you have Coutinho sitting there, and I know they play on the left and the right wing, so it's not the same. But if you have yeah. Coutinho and you have Demir, I think Xavi is like, okay, I'm going to trust, obviously, Coutinho in this instance, right? There's a reason why he, he is who he is, why he's such a problem in that he's too good of a player to be just a bench option or to be this guy on the peripheral of the, of the first team. 